Welcome to the first edition of a new television program sponsored by the city of Daytona Beach called Currents. And as the name suggests, we want you to tune in every month to see the latest happenings in the city of Daytona Beach. In today's episode, we're going to focus on Orange Avenue, the new Tomstead Veterans Memorial Bridge, the Flomish Woods Housing Development, and last but certainly not least, we're going to look at the Tanger Outlet Mall. Hope you enjoy today's program. We're at the beginning of this project where it all began. And so let's talk to these gentlemen and find out a little bit more about the Orange Avenue project. So Ryan, this is where it all started. Yes. Tell us a little bit about um, how things began with this project. Well, like a lot of projects, uh, things started off with, uh, with some challenges. Uh, the road uh, itself, the, the project for Orange Avenue, is just over one and a half miles uh, from basically from Nova Road down to Beach Street in the downtown area in Daytona. And the first section uh, that we're standing in right now is where actually the contractors uh, actually began. And that went from Nova Road to Keach Street. And we had our share of challenges in this area, uh, but for all intents and purposes, uh, it is uh, fairly close to being completed now. Got some dressing up on some surface work to do, uh, some pedestrian features that we need to finish up, and the final course of asphalt, of course, uh, needs to be installed. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's been a challenging project, like I said earlier, and uh, we're, we're, we're going to wrap it up soon. And Frank, with all your years of experience in public works, it's not unusual to find the kinds of challenges we found on this project, is it? No, sir, absolutely not. In fact, this is one of the top five most troublesome projects that I've ever encountered. Troublesome simply because of the constraints, the narrow right-of-ways, the age of the infrastructure and utilities underneath, and all the other factors that go along with a constrained facility. As you can see, Nova Road behind us is an arterial roadway and it's a DOT roadway. So mid this, excuse me, Orange Avenue is going to be our gateway through Midtown into downtown. And that's why we want this to be a first class facility. We're on the west side of the Orange Avenue project. And from here, we're gonna move over to the east side down near Palmetto Avenue. And right now I'm standing with Mr. Ryan Conrad in the heart of the last phases of the construction of this project. Ryan, can you tell us uh, what zone we're in here in this phase of the project and just what's going on right now? Yes, thank you, Ron. Uh, this is actually section four. This is the final section uh, of the project where the contractors began working on the underground and some of the probably most challenging areas on the job between uh, Marion Street and uh, Seagrave where, where we're standing right now. A lot of facilities here, uh, we worked close with city uh, folks to dig up in their archives uh, what, is, uh, what is underground here and, it's, and there, there's a whole lot of facilities that are, that are very, very old and hard to identify actually. And we're also going to be crossing underneath the FEC Railroad uh, right of way, uh, which is behind me. And that's probably one of the most challenging parts of any project uh, because the, the regulations and the uh, requirements to work in and around FEC right of way uh, is, is very strict. Um, some of the most technical stuff uh, that these guys are going to be uh, challenged with is going to be getting under those uh, those areas there. We're going to be using um, jack and bore technology and directional bore technology to get under the to get under the road there with brand new facilities. And you've been challenged uh, with getting people in and out of their their residences and and their businesses with this project as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, most of this project, basically from here Seagrave back all the way to Nova Road, the right of way is only 50 feet wide. Some of the underground that we've been putting in this uh, this section of the job is extremely large and extremely heavy, requiring some pretty big equipment. We've even had uh, some cranes out here to set some of the underground structures. Uh, if you can only imagine, it's kind of it's it's really shoulder to shoulder in here and to maneuver some of that big equipment around has made it very challenging to maintain access to businesses and residents but the contractor is uh, is charged with that that very thing they have to provide that access at all times so we've uh, we've put up lots of um, business sign access routes for the businesses to try to help patrons get to those uh, locations and also uh, we have communicated directly with it the contractors communicate directly as well with the local residents to make sure that they know how to get to and from their house during construction operations. Thank you very much, Ryan. You're welcome. 
Welcome back to Currents. I'm Reverend Dr. L. Ronald Durham. Today we're talking about the Orange Avenue project here in the city of Daytona Beach. And we're on the Palmetto East side of this project right now. And I'm going to be asking Mr. Ryan Conrad uh, a question about some of the things that enhance this particular project as we move forward. Welcome back, Ryan. Thank you. It's good to have you. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the things that make this project a little bit unique. Um, the ADA, uh, American with Disabilities Act requirements that were necessary, some of the enhancements that happened to uh, hearing impaired persons who were standing on the corner. Tell us a little bit about some of those improvements that were made. Okay, uh, some of the most important aspects of this project um, that was part of the city of Daytona Beach's goal was to bring up the uh, pedestrian facilities to federal uh, requirements. And part of that was to make the ramps, the proper slopes, the proper widths and so forth, and to uh, upgrade the uh, crosswalks uh, by using um, the accessible pedestrian uh, detection that you uh, are hearing in the background here, the beeping and so forth, uh, they actually talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, this area has a high concentration of folks with uh, uh, physical disabilities that, that uh, the city is investing to, to help those folks get around the downtown area. Um, some of the other things that they're doing is they're, uh, they're upgrading the uh, street lighting, uh, putting some brand new lights along here that will, that will increase the lighting throughout the whole pedestrian uh, travel way through the downtown area. And um, that's probably one of the, those are some of the most important aspects of this job that the city's investing in. Did you make the sidewalks wider for uh, persons as they're walking on the sidewalk itself? Yes, a lot of the areas downtown are receiving a, a, a straight 10 foot wide sidewalk. Some areas where we have some restrictions and some, uh, we did have the inability to reach that uh, dimension in some spots, so those will be six feet wide uh, at a minimum. Um, when you're working with an infrastructure that is uh, that dates back to the 40s, some of the stuff underground, it really creates challenges, and uh, that's one of the results of it. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. I'm back with uh, Mr. Frank Van Pelt. He's our Technical Services Director for the City of Daytona Beach. So, Frank, uh, we're almost getting to the completion uh, of the Orange Avenue project. Tell me how this uh, is going to impact the Public Works Department once it's completed. Well, look. Uh Ron, the Public Works Department is in charge of taking care of everything that's built with public dollars. Uh, we do different things for different facilities. In this particular uh, roadway, it'll be brand new, which will be a big start, a big jump start for all of us. Uh, the pavement is designed to last approximately 12 to 15 years before it needs to be resurfaced or rehabilitated. And that, that's barring any car wrecks or collisions where a fire might start. Same thing with the concrete. The concrete will outlast that. But if you know things crack because vehicles get on them, uh, because there's a, a crane that needs to lift an air conditioner, then that's normal maintenance that we'll have to take care of. The, the west end of this roadway is a three-lane facility that's two directional lanes and a bi-directional turn lane in the center. This end of the facility is a four-lane highway, which allows turn lanes in the center, and you have two directional lanes in each, each direction, east and west. Thank you, Frank. We really appreciate that information. Gentlemen, you gave the uh, public a lot of information in those clips. Uh, Frank, I, I was out on uh, Orange Avenue yesterday for several hours uh, talking with some of the businesses and residents in the area. And I guess the primary thing that came out of almost every conversation was, uh, when is the project going to be completed? I know there was a time frame uh, when it began. Uh, there were some uh, delays that were um, uh, encountered. So what, what kind of time frame are we looking at uh, right now for completion? Right now, we're looking at the end of September of this year for completion. Uh, delays were encountered, as everybody experiences in Florida, and uh, particularly folks in this quarter, you, we have intensive rainfall. We've had some minor flooding in the area that set back the contractor. We had some unanticipated discoveries once we opened up the ground that Ryan had alluded to earlier uh, in, the, in the form of deteriorated infrastructure that we didn't anticipate some infrastructure we didn't even know was under there that had either been abandoned or was just not being used at this current time and we had uh, a lot of problems with you know different deliveries holidays come in all these things tended to make this go a little later than we had anticipated 
but it's still on track uh, as far as the legitimate construction days that need to go forward because none of us can build anything without encountering some type of a problem. And as I said earlier, Ryan, on the, on the uh, video, that's not unusual. Uh, delays do happen, and I think the coordination is something that um, the, the public needs to know about. There, were, there are three major contractors on this project, if I'm not mistaken. Can you tell us a little bit about who they are and, and what their responsibilities are? Yes, sir. The, uh, the main infrastructure uh, construction, it, which is the, the roadway, uh, the sidewalks, the curbs, the utilities such as the reclaimed water main, water main itself, um, the storm system, anything that, in the sanitary as well, uh, that's being done by a local contractor, uh, Thadcon Construction. Um, they are, uh, they're, they're doing a good job. Um, Sometimes it doesn't seem like it, but they are. They run into a lot of challenges on this job, like, uh, like Frank said. Um, the downtown area in particular, some of this infrastructure dates back to the, uh, uh, to the 40s. We just don't know everything that's going on underground, unfortunately, until we dig it up sometimes. Um, the signal contractor uh, is uh, Chinchor, uh, Chinchor Electric. They're out of uh, Orange City. A uh, very reputable contractor. They've done a fantastic job out here. They've, uh, they've dealt with about uh, just about every kind of coordination challenge that, uh, that we could throw at them, and they've done a fantastic job. Uh, Carter Electric uh, is uh, installing the uh, street lighting system. Uh, they work for uh, Thadcon, and they're also doing part of the um, FPL undergrounding, which is a very critical part of this project. Well, gentlemen, um it, it has been a pleasure being with you both in the field and here in the studio. I want to commend you on the job that you're doing. And I know that with all the projects in the city of Daytona Beach that are on the horizon, you'll be back in the studio again uh, to talk about something. Thank, thanks a lot. We appreciate having you here today. Well. Welcome to Daytona Beach Television. I'm your host, Reverend Dr. L. Ronald Durham. I'm standing on Orange Avenue where the road construction is pretty much done now, but I'm standing with, with Mr. Ricardo Rodriguez, who is with SLR Communications. They're putting fiber optic cable underground at this location. All of this used to be above ground, and part of the improvement of Orange Avenue was putting this cable underground. And so I wanted to get out here and have you see exactly what they're doing. Ricardo, thank you for being on Daytona Beach Television today. So talk a little bit about the cable work that's going underground that SLR is doing. All right. Thank you for having me. Uh, basically what we're doing is, uh, like you said, installing fiber optics for future expansion and upgrades and the beautification, you know, get everything off the pole, make everything look nice. And we're happy to be out here to have the work and, and move forward in the economy. And, you know, fiber optics going underground, is that something new or how long has that been around? Do you know? I found out yesterday, shocking, that it's been around for 30, 40 years. They just didn't know what to do with it. But now that we, you know, have the technology to take advantage of it, that's what's going on. And, and because it's underground, uh, when there are storms that are coming through, which is typical for Florida, people will probably be able to keep their cable on instead of it cutting in and out because of the storm going through, right? Right. More likely to be, you know, keep their service, correct. Thank you for, for being on the uh, program today on Daytona Beach Television. I appreciate it. Sure. Keep up the good work. And uh, I know having work is a good thing. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's good to have you on the program yeah, today. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm standing right across from the old police station on Nova and Orange Avenue. Behind me is a crew from Bright House Television. The old cable that was above ground is now being moved to an underground utility with fiber optics, which will mean much less interrupted service when storms come into the area, and you'll have a better, clearer, crisper picture on your cable TV channels. The Orange Avenue project is nearing completion in September, and I look forward to it, and I know you do too. I'm standing on the corner of 955 Orange Avenue, and the roadway is coming to full completion. Behind me, there are several businesses that now have easy access in and out for their clients to access the businesses on this corner. We're moving quickly. September, this roadway will be completely finished. This gateway from Nova all the way down to Beach Street where the new Veterans Memorial Bridge is being constructed and we'll be going to that next to show you a little bit about what's happening down on Beach and Orange Avenue. I'm so happy you're watching the program today and we look forward to bringing you more exciting episodes about those projects going on in the city of Daytona Beach.
Behind me is what we have commonly called here in Daytona Beach the Orange Avenue Bridge. It is better known as Memorial Bridge. But this bridge that has been here in the city of Daytona Beach, a drawbridge for more than 60 years, is now going to be replaced by the new Tomstead Veterans Memorial Bridge. This will be a high-span, multi-columned bridge that will be state-of-the-art covering the Halifax River. There will be uh, many enhancements to the bridge that will make the walkways wider, they, it will be a Veterans Memorial Bridge, which will have 32 plaques that will cover the bridge that will commemorate many of the things that happened during several wars throughout the history of our country. This is a $38 million project sponsored by the County of Volusia. During the day, from 7 a.m. until 5.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, they will be driving pilings into the Halifax River, which will create a little bit of a noise factor. But there will not be noise during the evening while those in the area are sleeping in their residences. There will be very few interruptions on the weekend, uh, very few weekend activities that will be going on unless it's by special request. The bridge uh, will be 32 months to complete. And when it is complete, it will be a state-of-the-art facility. There will be a fishing pier on each side of the bridge where people will be able to come and have recreation going on with their families and do great fishing right in the Halifax River. And so we're looking forward to this project. The road is still open on Orange Avenue between Peninsula Drive and the courthouse. You'll be able to come through as far as the courthouse is concerned. But Beach Street as well will remain open during the 32 month construction. There'll be very, very little impact at all on the roadway of Beach Street and the merchants. So we're looking forward in 32 months to a grand, grand ribbon cutting where this bridge will be officially dedicated and you'll be able to see it firsthand. LED lighting will be underneath the bridge that will really make the bridge at night pop and look like something out of this world. We're looking forward to the Tomstead Veterans Memorial Bridge and we'll bring you more great episodes at Currents on Daytona Beach Television as time moves forward. Thank you very much for watching this episode and we'll talk to you soon. Let me welcome my guest to the studio today, Mr. Emery Counts, who is the Economic Development Director for the City of Daytona Beach. Welcome, Mr. Counts. Thank you so much. It's good to have you on Currents today. Let's talk a little bit about something that's uh, kind of new to our uh, city. It's a development uh, out on Flomich Woods, in the Flomich Woods area, and it's a new project under the leadership of uh, your team. And I wanted to ask you, back on uh, April 29th, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, your department had a uh, dedication type program at the new Flomich Woods housing development that I was a small part of. How did the idea um, come about to develop the low cost housing in that location in particular? It began with a generous donation of land from Consolidated Tomoka. Uh, it was pristine land, uh, so there were trees and shrubs and rocks and everything at that location. Um, it was quite a lift to ready that land to uh, build homes on. Um, first, uh, Fort Macaulay Construction, an uh, outfit that was in town doing another project, uh, came through and said, hey, listen, we want to do something for the community, and we will clear this land and put in the uh, in infrastructure, which included the pipes and road. Uh, once we had that, uh, we thought, well, how many lots can we get out of this development? And I believe there are 30, 24 lots, rather, at that development. Uh, we had uh, partners, uh, Central Florida Community Development Corporation, uh, Habitat for Humanity, Mid Florida Housing Partnership, and a host of other partners that helped us to make this thing happen. Once the idea and project is developed, it has to get to a funding stage. Mm -hmm. um, so how was the city of Daytona Beach able to get the necessary funds in place uh, to begin the Flomish Woods uh, development? 
Uh, well, we had donations, mm -hmm. uh, and we, uh, the city of Daytona Beach is a participating jurisdiction, a PJ, if you would. So we get home funds each year. Um, not sure how much we got that year, but we were able to uh, make those funds available for down payment assistance. That was not uh, the end of it, though, because as you know, we had a downturn in the economy and our buyers could not get first mortgages. So th this wasn't something that happened then overnight. It took some time for, for the Boy. Flemish Woods uh, project to really uh, go to the shovel ready. Absolutely. It was uh, a better part of 20 years to get this thing uh, 20 years. totally developed, agreed. Oh yeah. um, again, our buyers could not get first mortgages. Um, one of our buyers was turned down five times for a $22,000 loan. Mm. Uh, the city increased its subsidy to try to uh, get the ball moving, and even that didn't work. Um, finally, one of the contractors who built a home out there uh, could not get it financed and decided to finance it uh, themselves. And that began the ball uh, rolling and she did, uh, she and her husband did one, then two, then three, and then uh, the economy somehow turned around mm -hmm. and everybody wanted to get involved. So now we've got um, Bank of America, Fifth Third Bank, and some others participating. Right. Well, there's some video footage, uh, Emery, that I think uh, I want you to look at, both of us to look at, and we'll come back and talk a little bit about it uh, on the end of that. Excellent. The Flemish Woods housing development began with a generous donation of land from Consolidated Tomoka Land Company in 1997 and a grand vision by the city to create quality opportunities for affordable housing. And with that, this important housing subdivision was on its way to becoming a reality. The city also contracted with three nonprofit organizations, Central Florida CDC, Halifax Habitat for Humanity, and Mid-Florida Housing Partnership to help identify potential homeowners and counsel them through the home buying process. A huge breakthrough occurred when Fort Macaulay Construction volunteered to donate the road and utilities infrastructure. However, even with this grand stroke of favor, completion of the project proved to be an uphill battle. Though the development had been publicly advertised as open to buyers, immense challenges obstructed clients from securing their first mortgages. Progress was extremely slow because banks discontinued construction firm finance, which had provided monies to contractors to carry them. While a home was being built, this made it much more difficult for smaller contractors to participate in the program since they seldom had enough capital to complete a project up front and then wait to be paid. Furthermore, the downswing in the housing market meant bank financing was just short of impossible. Even for relatively well-to-do households, one client was turned down for first mortgage financing five times for a $22,000 loan. In spite of having $70,000 in support from the city toward a home cost of $92,000, Finally, the contractor decided to float the $22,000 loan over a five-year period just to get the ball moving. The partners stayed with the project, however, and now the banking climate has improved. Several clients have gotten first mortgages and Flomage Woods is just one house away from complete build-out. Complete in Flomage Woods, like so many other affordable housing subdivisions across the state, was an uphill battle all the way to the finish. We are glad that the city of Daytona Beach and its partners never gave up on the vision and continued to fight for nearly two decades to win this very important battle to create significant affordable housing opportunities for a number of deserving households. Welcome, Welcome home. So Emory, I think it's exciting to see uh, actual raw uh, land uh, being turned over by uh, shovels and bulldozers and becoming a, a vibrant community mm -hmm. that now will have children interacting in front of their homes and playing uh, on those on those properties. So I want to commend you for, for a job well done. Now when it comes to a project like this, um, the homes are built. 
the next phase is you got to put people in the home. So how are prospective homeowners identified? Uh, and once they are identified, what does the economic development team then do uh, to ensure that they can actually purchase the home? It starts with uh, working with our nonprofit pr uh, partners. Uh, they, um, the, the client will contact one of those nonprofits and they run them through the steps. Uh, credit counseling, ho housing counseling, and other programs to get them ready. Uh, the final step is to uh, prepare a, a loan package to a bank and they go in and see how much house they can afford. Okay, so is the example of Flomich Woods um, and that particular development something that the city can do in other places uh, throughout the uh, the city itself. Absolutely. Uh, Flemish Woods is actually our third development of that type. Uh, we've done Cardinal Estates, we did uh, Loomis Trails, and then uh, Flemish Woods. Um, uh, I call it a development because we have a number of houses in one location. Uh, we've done this same model at scattered site around the city. And so I want to shift gears a little bit because Flomich Woods is kind of a residential uh, project and I want to shift to a commercial project that's getting a lot of buzz in the city, a lot of excitement is going on right now, uh, and that is the Tanger Outlets Mall project. Uh, so yes. Talk a little bit about that um, in this next part of our, our interview with you. So Tanger Outlet Malls. Um, is part of a large development that's happening near uh, the Trader Joe's distribution center, is that correct? Uh, Tanger Outlet Mall, um, uh, Sam's, and some other development is all in a, uh, an area we call uh, Tomoka Town Center. Mm -hmm. And Tomoka Town Center is about 209 acres. Tanger is going to be on 39 of those acres. Uh, Sam's Club is going to be about 22.5 of those acres. And we have another outfit, North American, that has purchased the balance of the of the 209 acres. Oh boy! So, how big, in terms of, um, uh, I guess, really in terms of square footage and in terms of its impact on the city, how big is the Tanger Outlets development? Oh, the, the exact footage of of Tanger. Just I just know it's on 39 acres, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, touted to. Uh, to have between 80 and 100 uh, premium outlet stores. I did make a, uh, I brought a note <coughs> to see some kind, some of the kinds of stores that might be there. Oh, yeah, and, uh, I was going to ask you that. Oh, oh <laughs> Bash, Bash Shoe Factory Outlet, uh, Polo Ralph Lauren, uh, Hager Clothing, Cole Hahn, Brooks Brothers, Clark Bostonian Shoe Company, mm -hmm. Oshkosh Bagash, Rockport, and Nike. Oh, so, so those are some premium stores that you see um, all over the country. So uh, it, it's going to really bring an economic, I think, impact to the city. W would you say that? Oh, absolutely. As we get more visitors coming to Daytona Beach looking at what we have here, I think we're going to get more persons wanting to live, work, and play here. So I think uh, this is uh, just like uh, Trader Joe's put us on the map for commercial development. I think uh, Tanger is going to put us on the map for other types of development in Daytona Beach. Yeah, and the, the location is strategic as well, being positioned right near I-95. Uh, it's something that people are gonna see as they're passing through this corridor and take the, that exit and, and get off and do some shopping in our area. So I think that makes a tremendous impact. Absolutely, uh, I've seen some of the Tanger Outlet Malls, uh, more recent ones, and they are um, picturesque. It looks like something you want to pull over and investigate. Mm -hmm. So again, we're 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 hoping for a lot of visitation. Well, we've got some video uh, uh -huh. of Tanger, so let's let's take a look at that. Fantastic. Okay. And from our Orange Avenue project, we're now standing almost on the corner of Williamson Boulevard and LPGA Boulevard near I-95. And this is the site of the Tanger Outlet Mall construction that's going on right now. Some of you may be wondering, why would we go from Orange Avenue to the Tanger Outlet? Well, that stretch of Orange Avenue that's now being completed, because of that infrastructure improvement that's being done right now, it's going to allow for businesses like the Tanger Outlet Mall to see the benefit of coming to the city of Daytona Beach, which is concerned about making sure that the infrastructure for its citizens is state of the art. 
And because of that state of the art construction going on now, we now have this new, brand new facility that's being built here in our city. And let me tell you some of the great things about the Tanger Outlet Mall, in my opinion. Number one, it's going to bring great shopping into our area. Number two, it's going to be, be really a good place for those of you who are looking for employment to come and find a, an outstanding job that you can work in. And number three, it's going to be an economic stimulus to our community that I believe is going to really impact all that we do in the city of Daytona Beach. And so I'm excited about this new construction and there's many, many more projects like this in our city that I'm looking forward to bringing you right here on Currents every month. Thank you. Well, Emory, I can't tell you how excited I am about uh, the Tanger Outlet Mall coming into Daytona Beach. And let's kind of look at a time frame. When, uh, when is the um, project scheduled for completion? Um, the company has stated that they want to be complete uh, by Black Friday, uh, uh, the Thanksgiving Day weekend. Um, one other thing I'll add about Tanger in terms of, you mentioned jobs, mm -hmm. um, we estimate that there are going to be about 800 jobs created, full-time okay. jobs created, mm -hmm. and if I had a guess, we're not sure what the wage is going to be, but mm -hmm. if I had a guess, I'd say the wages would be between 34000 to 41000 mm -hmm. That will certainly uh, impact our community in a big way mm -hmm. uh, for the residents to be able to go out and, and gain employment, those who are looking. So. Uh, can we expect to see more uh, um, new development in the LPGA Interstate I-95 area uh, of the city? Well, you may know that uh, there's uh, Mento Communities are, are building another 3,400 homes. It's going to be developed over about a 10-year period. And we have another outfit, don't happen to have their name that I can share with you today, but they've uh, come on board and they want to do another 1,000 homes. So 4,400 mm. homes. Uh, for some of those visitors that are coming to Tanger and get caught up in the Daytona Beach Blitz and want to be here, uh, we'll have homes for them. Well, Mr. Counts, I want to thank you for being my guest here on Currents today and certainly for everything that you do in economic development uh -huh. uh, to help our city grow and, and for our residents to find uh, new opportunities for themselves uh, to be employed. It, it really means a lot to uh, everything that we think uh, needs to happen in this city. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and if I had to make uh, one comment at the end of all of this, I work in economic and community development, it is that um, I've worked long enough to, uh, and hard enough, I guess, to see some of the fruits of that labor, mm. and I am excited. I'm excited about the future of Daytona Beach. As am I. I uh, see, you know, I have the privilege of uh, sitting in on some of the public works meetings every Tuesday and, and seeing some of the things that are coming down the pipeline. It is exciting. This, this city is poised for tremendous growth. Uh, and I'm encouraged by what I see happening right now. So thank you so much. You've been watching the first episode of Currents. I'm your host, the Reverend Dr. L. Ronald Durham. Let me thank you for uh, watching this series and keep looking because there will be new and exciting things that we bring to you month after month. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>